welcome back everyone uh, in this lecture we will uh, continue with the group action and we see various applications of group action so let's uh, begin uh, let g be a group and uh, x be a non empty subset so let's say g acts on capital x via some homomorphism tau so then uh, we define the following thing and we prove this uh, orbit decomposition theorem so what it says okay for given x in capital x we have this orbit of x that is all possible images of x under the action of capital g so then we proved that this set of all orbits so that will form a partition of this capital x okay so in particularly so we have if we denote this x mod g by the set of all orbits of x sorry of x with respect to this action action of g so then <coughs> we have the following uh, decomposition of x with respect to this uh, uh, x mod g okay so we often identify this indexing set with this x mod g so that's what we did okay the indexing set is chosen to be a subset of this capital x such that so whenever you take this uh, so this is some subset of capital x so let's write it again so capital lambda is subset of x such that capital lambda intersection this orbit of x for any orbit so that has cardinality exactly 1 for all x in capital x or for all orbits for all orbits in x mod g so in particularly we have a natural bijection from capital lambda to x mod g okay there is this natural bijective correspondence with uh, capital lambda and x mod g with this bijection we can identify capital lambda with x mod g so then uh, we can uh, write x as disjoint union of all these orbits okay where this x runs over from capital lambda so this is actually called orbit decomposition of capital x okay so in particularly we were interested in a particular type of decomposition so we can collect those orbits that are having just singleton elements and those orbits that are having more than one elements so for that purpose we defined what is called this capital lambda naught so this is those x in capital lambda such that the size of the orbit is exactly 1 and capital lambda 1 or let us say capital lambda greater than 1. So this is those x in capital lambda such that the orbit having exactly more number of elements. Okay. So then with this notation we, we have partition this x into again further subsets so you take orbits that are coming from this lambda naught okay so these orbits ox x is coming from lambda naught and then disjoint union disjoint union orbits where x is coming from lambda 1 okay so let me call this lambda 1. So now if you take element that is coming from this lambda dot we see that this is if and only if the orbit is having just one element if and only if all the elements of capital G that fixes this x for all G in G. So that means this x in lambda naught is nothing but all those x in 
okay this is for the lf x is in the fixed point subset of this uh, action of g okay that is x power g so in particularly one can rewrite this equation so one can rewrite this equation as follows so you can write x equal to x power g disjoint union disjoint union orbit x where x is coming from lambda 1 okay so this is what we called orbit decomposition of capital x okay so now in particularly if the capital x is finite so then we have the following observation so if the cardinality of x is finite so then the cardinality of x can be computed as follows which is exactly equal to cardinality of x power g plus summation all the sum of the cardinality of the orbits where x is coming from this particular uh, indexing set lambda 1. So recall that this lambda 1 is very very important uh, indexing set this can be identified with those orbits coming from x mod g such that the cardinality of the orbit is exactly greater than 1 having more than 1 element. So now recall what is this uh, orbit stabilizer theorem. So the orbit stabilizer theorem tells us how to compute uh, the number of elements in the orbit okay. So in particularly using this orbit stabilizer theorem okay from orbit stabilizer theorem we have the orbit x which is the number of elements in this orbit is exactly equal to the index of the stabilizer of x inside this g okay which is exactly the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of g x if cardinality g is finite okay. So we can also assume uh, this g is finite set so g is finite group so in particularly the index is given by the ratio of cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx using this Lagrange's theorem. So in particularly if we know all information about the group like the group uh, we know and then all possible subgroups we know and then their order and so on. So then using that information one can calculate the cardinality of given x okay. So now by rewriting the orbit decomposition we get the cardinality of x equal to cardinality of x power g plus summation the index which is the ratio of this cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx where x comes from this particular subset lambda 1. So where what is uh, this gx so gx is the stabilizer of x that is those g in g such that that g actually stabilizes x that means it leaves invariant g dot x equal to x okay so this is called the stabilizer stabilizer of x so note that it is a subgroup and uh, this is actually the index of uh, that subgroup so now uh, let's try to understand uh, the connection between these stabilizers okay so this is actually very very important uh, equality so in this equality uh, we need to understand uh, this uh, indexing set this lambda 1 okay the lambda 1 recall this is those orbits <coughs> so this can be identified with the those orbits in x mod g such that this the cardinality of the orbit is greater than 1 okay so now let us understand uh, the connections between the stabilizers okay. So for example uh, we can we can take some element in the orbit itself okay let us say some y is in the orbit of x okay. So fix x in capital X and then take uh, take this y is in this orbit of x. So in particularly y can be written as some g dot x for some g in capital G. Okay. So now what we want to do we want to actually relate uh, these uh, the stabilizer of x and the stabilizer of g. So is there any connection between gy and gx. 
So, if you think about it, the connection is the stabilizer of G y is given by the stabilizer of G x, the conjugate, conjugate of stabilizer of G x. The conjugation is by this element G. So, G, G x, G inverse will be exactly G y. Okay, so, let us prove this. So, what is the proof? So, the proof, so we prove that G y is contained in G, G x, G inverse and vice versa. So, now let us start with some element okay, H in G y. So, by definition, so if and only if H dot y is going to be y. So, that is by definition. So, that means what if and only if you rewrite H dot G dot x is going to be exactly g dot x. So, now what we can do? We can apply g inverse on both side. So, if you apply g inverse on both side from this what we get? So, this star is equal to by applying g inverse you get g inverse dot h dot g dot x is going to be exactly equal to g inverse dot g dot x. But using the group action, so we can get this element by applying this particular element of the group G inverse HG on this X. On the right hand side, this is going to be G inverse dot G, sorry, G inverse G dot X. But G inverse G is nothing but identity. So, this gives us that g inverse h g dot x is nothing but identity dot x which is x. So, that means, so this says that if and only if g inverse h g is an element of g x. So, that means if and only if h is in g g x g inverse. So, all this argument can be reversible okay, everywhere we have actually if and only if. So, h is in g y if and only if we proved that H is in G, G x, G inverse. So, that means, that means G x, the conjugate of G x, G, G x, G inverse is same as G y. So, that is what we proved. So, we verified this. So, this is very important observation. If you take uh, two elements from the same orbit, then the stabilizers of them are very much related they are indeed conjugate of each other and the conjugacy is given by very specific element. Okay. So, this is uh, very important. So, this actually tells from the combinatorial point of view the cardinality of g x is same as cardinality of g y. So, as a corollary we get uh, for any two element x and y in the orbit. Okay, Let us say this is one orbit we have the cardinality of g x is same as cardinality of g y. Okay. So, this is just some orbit. So, that means, uh, if you know for some reason the cardinality of g x and then if you look at all possible orbits of x, then the, the stabilizer of those elements will have the same cardinality. Okay. So, that actually helps us to kind of compute uh, the cardinality of x uh, using this uh, orbit uh, decomposition. Okay, Let us move on. Uh, so, now we want to understand uh, the kernel of this action. So, this tau is a map from g to s x. So, as I said before, so given this group action which is a group homomorphism from uh, g to s x. So, this is actually a group homomorphism. So, we can talk about the kernel of this uh, group action or this uh, homomorphism. Okay. So, what is the kernel? So, kernel by definition those uh, elements of G that are mapped to identity map on X. Okay. So, the kernel by definition those elements of capital G such, the, such that tau G is identity on capital, capital X. So, this G goes to tau G is the map. So, this is a group homomorphism. So, now if we rewrite uh, the definition of this kernel, you can see that. So, this is going to be those g and g such that g dot x is going to be x for all x in capital X. 
So, that means so this is going to be so what is g dot x equal to x means that means g is in the stabilizer of x ok. So, sim, so the condition on this kernel simply says that this g must be in the stabilizer of x for all x in x. So, that means this is there in the intersection of g x x in x in capital capital x ok. So, indeed what we proved so the kernel of this uh, the kernel of this group action or the group homomorphism is nothing but intersection of g x x coming from capital x. So, this is this is what we have proved. So, this is very important uh, notion for example, if the kernel is trivial then we know that this map tau is actually injective homomorphism ok. So, it is not uh, hard to prove ok I will leave it as exercise ok. So, if you have a group homomorphism let us say f from uh, g to g dash ok this is a group homomorphism. So, then ok we have this following characterization of injective map. So, f is an injective map. So, that means this is a one to one map if and only if the kernel of this uh, homomorphism is actually trivial ok. So, one can take this as definition when uh, when you are dealing with uh, group homomorphism definition of injective map ok. This is uh, indeed very trivial to check. So, in particularly if you have the kernel of this uh, uh, group action is trivial ok then this g is embedded inside this S x ok this is very important uh, phenomena ok. Sometime if you are interested in understanding this group g ok. So, you make this group act on some some very nice set capital X ok and then embed this group inside ok this uh, symmetric group of that uh, that set capital X. So, then using the information about the symmetric group you can actually uh, get more information about, about the the group that you started with. For example, uh, computations uh, that you want to do in the group ok that can be done using the computations that we know how to do in the symmetric group ok between any two elements ok. So, let us uh, move on. So, now we will see many interesting uh, applications of this group action ok. So, in particularly first I want to begin with uh, the Kayleigh's theorem ok which again talks about uh, embedding a finite group inside some, some symmetric group. It is a very very important uh, result uh, from the classification point of view ok. So, let us uh, state and prove. So, we have this Kayleigh's theorem. So, what it says? So, let us start with the group G ok. So, let G be a group. So, then so we have a natural map so which we called it capital L ok it is a given by the left multiplication. So, so from G to the symmetric group on G. So, this is indeed injective homomorphism. So, this is called this is called Kayleigh's theorem ok. For example, if you start with a finite group G which has cardinality n let us say the cardinality of G is n then we are saying G can be embedded inside S n ok. So, since n is fixed so this immediately proves that as a corollary ok the number of groups of order n up to isomorphism must be finite because any group of order n can be embedded inside S n for that particular n ok. S n is actually a finite group of order n factorial. So, since number of subgroups of S n is finite, so the total number of subgroups are finite in particularly subgroups of order n that also must be finite. So, that implies that immediately the number of groups of order n up to isomorphism must be finite ok that is immediate corollary. 
So, in case if you are interested in actually classifying all possible groups of order n up to isomorphism, then this theorem immediately implies that it is enough to classify all subgroups of order n inside S n okay, up to isomorphism, but uh, that is not indeed actually very easy problem, it is actually very difficult problem, but the Cayley's theorem immediately tells that the classification of the classification of order n groups okay, up to isomorphism boils, boils down to classifying all subgroups of order n in S n. Of course, one can do it up to isomorphism not a problem. Okay, but this question even though it sounds like we have actually uh, we have reduced the problem to S n still this is very very hard problem. Okay. Okay, let us try to actually prove this uh, map capital L is actually injective homomorphism. So, recall what is this map. Okay. So, here is the proof. So, recall L is defined as follows. L is a map from G to S G given by G goes to L G where L G is a map from G to G given by X goes to G X. So, it is basically a left multiplication. So, now we want to actually understand we already verified this is indeed group homomorphism. Okay. So, if, if, if not done please verify. Okay. So, verify L is a group homomorphism. Okay. So, now we want to prove that L is indeed injective map. Okay. Look at the kernel what is the kernel of L. So, kernel of L is going to be those elements G and G such that L G is identity map on capital G. So, what is the meaning of L G is being identity map on capital G that is if and only if G X should be exactly equal to X for all G and G. Okay. So, now note that we can particularly take G to be identity okay, sorry X to be identity. So, this is uh, wrong this is true for all X in capital G because G is given. So, for G in G L G equal to identity on G if and only if G X equal to X for all X in G. So, now in particularly you set x equal to identity then you get g equal to identity. So, now g is identity then it is easy to see that g x equal to x for all x in g. So, that proves that the kernel of L is exactly equal to identity. So, that means L is injective map. Okay. So, that is simply Kailas theorem. So, we can also uh, reprove actually uh, Lagrange's theorem. Okay. So, let us revisit and then prove it using group action. So, here is Lagrange's theorem. So, we already proved it, but now we are proving this using group action. So, what is the what is the theorem? Recall so, G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G. So, if this is given then the order of H divides order of G. In particularly the order of G divided by order of H. So, this is going to be exactly equal to the index of H in G. So, this is going to count exactly the number of left cosets of H inside G. So, this is what Lagrange's theorem. 
ओके सो ना टू प्रूव द लग्रांज स्थिरा वी नीड टू चूज द करेक्ट ग्रूप अंड से कैपिटल एक्स अंड दरेक्ट ग्रूप ऐक्शन ओके ऑब्वियली दिस इज अबउट द सब ग्रूप हैच सो वि टेक द ग्रूप टू बी हैच सो हैच इज युवर ग्रूप and then your set x to be g and then look at this right multiplication with respect to this uh, h so basically g to g we have a right multiplication we will restrict that to h that is the action h to sg so where h is map to this right multiplication of h which is a map from g to g given by g go to gh okay so this is the action that we are talking about so this is simply a right multiplication restricted to h because we have this right multiplication from g to sg and then the map is given by g goes to let's say rg where rg is a map from g to g where x goes to x g is what given okay you restrict r to r restricted h so that is your r h so now you can see that uh, so h, h x will be uh, disjoint union of disjoint union of cosets sorry union of orbits so with respect to this action okay so with respect to this so let's look at the orbit okay for example orbit of the identity is going to be so all possible images of this identity so which is going to be e h h in h okay so by definition this is exactly okay let me write it so by definition this is exactly this r h of h applied on this identity so that is going to be just e h okay so let me rewrite because some computation maybe you can take it as exercise just prove that by definition the orbit of identity is nothing but e h where h in h so which is exactly equal to h so now if you take any other element orbit of g for g in g we can see that this is going to be just g h where where h comes from h so this is exactly the coset g capital h so in particularly so this union of the orbits will be disjoint union of all these cosets where g comes from this uh, x mod h which is g mod h okay so now you can see that using this orbit decomposition theorem the cardinality of x which is cardinality of g is exactly equal to summation the cardinality of h where the sum runs over exactly k number of times where k is exactly the cardinality of g modulo h so that is because the cardinality of g h is same as cardinality of h for all g in g okay so then this sum runs over k number of orbits so exactly it is going to give you k times the cardinality of h so that is what we wanted to prove okay so the number of left cosines of h in g which is k is equal to the index of h in g okay so we got these two immediate uh, theorems uh, as corollary of uh, uh, group actions okay we will actually see later many interesting corollaries so i will stop here we will continue in the next class